Good morning, everyone. Oh, that's right. Good morning. There we go. I'm super excited to have some of the favorite people in our district um, partners on the stage today to have a great conversation. I want to first by acknowledging the Cajon Valley School uh, Governing Board. Would you please stand and be recognized? They make this work possible. And we're going to start off with a short video and then introduce you to our panelists. I'm 14 years old and I want to be a fashion designer when I get older. I want to either like design cars or do something with cars. I would want to be known for social justice. I want to be a pro gamer when I grow up. Why don't we introduce the panelists and start with the short after that? The reverse order here. From the University of San Diego, Dr. Lisa Dolly. Hello. CEO of Nepris, Sabri Raja. <laughs> CEO of American Student Assistant, Dr. Jean Eddy. <laughs> CEO of San Diego Workforce Partnership, Peter Kallstrom. <laughs> and from the, from the Myers-Briggs Company, Chris Mackey. <laughs> and Cajon Valley's own Chief Innovation Officer, Ed Hidalgo. <laughs> I'm David, I'm the superintendent. I'm going to be walking around and hopefully have, uh, hand the mic to you for questions because this is supposed to be audience participatory. Uh, we're going to start off, are we ready for a short video? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we, can, we can pivot if we don't have the video. The panel. <laughs> okay. We do yeah. have some slides. <laughs> you know, I, I, I trust you, but I'll have to see it for myself. Two minutes of pure joy. Here we are. Cool. We can just start the panel if we don't have the video. That's fine. Yeah. Ed, why don't you start us off and talk about this amazing collection of folks that have been working on some big problems in the district, but also in our country. Thank you, David. Um, big question, um, but easy answer because I've been working with some of the most amazing people um, in an ecosystem that's really transforming uh, the work that we're doing in education. Whether it's in workforce, whether it's in higher ed, whether it's in technology, whether it's in research, and whether it's in the tools that we use to ensure that every child has the opportunity for a valid, reliable, and empirically based assessment to, to coordinate and to bring a team together that works so um, humbly, caringly, supportively, is open to quick shifts and changes, always looking for the next opportunity, and is always open to hearing another person's word and idea, has been truly a pleasure and a blessing. So I, I couldn't be doing this work without the people on this panel, and I highly encourage all of you to get to know who these people are, because they're truly changing their world of work in a way that will change our students possible future selves. Thank you. So everybody who's downloaded the ASU GSV app, when you click on it, you see American Student Assistance. And here's CEO, Jean Eddy. Would you tell us a little bit about the organization and why this work is so important to you? Sure, absolutely. So as David said, I'm Jean Eddy. I'm CEO and President of American Student Assistance. And our mission statement says that we are uh, part of this world because we want kids or we want to help kids know themselves, know their options, and make informed choices about their education and career goals. And why do we care so desperately about that? For a number of years, we were a guarantor of student loans. In other words, we were the people who helped kids repay their student loans when they graduated or left college. But we, what we found was we were oftentimes coming in at the end of the day when decisions had been made that were not necessarily those that could help a student figure out what they wanted to do as they walked into this world. We found that if we could start earlier, that we could have the kind of impact with young people that we would like to have and influence their choices and their decisions as they move through this process. 
Um, what I love about working with Ed and the world of work is that we allow kids to get to know themselves. What makes their heart sing? What are the things that they want to do that translates into that next thing for them? And then hopefully guide them on a journey to help them when they finish high school to be able to make really good choices about what the next thing is for them. It doesn't have to be college, it could be training, it could be some kind of a certification, but really what matters to a young person that helps them want to do something for the rest of their lives. Panel response? 1.5 trillion in student loans. Talk about a barrier that that might present for opportunity youth, Peter. Yeah, thanks, David, and great to be here, and I'm so amazed because Andre Agassi is on stage right now. Maybe I should be right now. It's a great testament to Ed's backhand. He's, he's a great talent. Ed actually hired me seven years ago, so I literally wouldn't be here. He was on our workforce board at the time, and so I'm always appreciative of that. But just working with Ed as a real visionary and helping us transform what we do. So at the Workforce Partnership, we, like workforce development entities across the country, serve adult and dislocated workers primarily, and then youth with some of the federal money. So we work with federal money, fund the Career Center Network, who reach those, those folks who've been dislocated and need to be upskilled in order to get into the workforce. But we've changed our, our work uh, dramatically in, in uh, the time that we've been working together uh, in, in order to really expand beyond the boundaries of the uh, and the boundaries literally of the federal dollars because it's very restrictive and can only do so much. But we've expanded to work with city dollars, county, private sector, and philanthropy. And to address the opportunity youth crisis, we've really dove in on this uh, dramatically in the past few years, put out a report uh, coming up on our third annual conference, May 2nd, at the Town and Country, where we work throughout the day to uh, raise awareness of this crisis. Uh, the, 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 the issue, as you may well know, is 16 to 24 year olds not working and not in school. The number in San Diego County alone is 41,000. So think of Petco Park filled with youth who are not yet finding their place in, in the world and struggling with that transition from, from youth to adulthood. We have to get ahead of that. We have to change that. Nationally, five million. It's a quiet crisis. Many people are just simply not aware of that. And if we don't address that now, then the future of many of those is very bleak. And we just have to get ahead of it, and we can. And that's why I like the term opportunity youth far better than disconnected, because it's our opportunity, too, to change this narrative. And so May 2nd, join us if you can, town and country. But to address the student loan crisis with opportunity youth, we've uh, also started up a new endeavor with income share agreements. We're the first workforce entity of 550 in the country to create an income share pool, which uh, income share agreements are where we have the philanthropic funds to fund the cost for the higher ed work, the certificate work with our partner UCSD Extension as step one, pay for their coursework. Their payback is based upon their future income. So a lot of skin in the game. It's not just the student debt that the student and the, and the family have to incur. But we're in the game, UCSD extension, and then we all win the better they do. So more to come on that. It's very early days. We've raised three and a half million dollars. We're gonna have a 100 person cohort in the first go round, all in IT. So expand beyond that in the future. But this is to target underserved, underrepresented populations without mm -hmm. the means to be able to acquire what it takes to get into um, great careers. So more to come on that, but that's part of what we're doing to address that crisis. And those ISAs are key because we need to make sure that the talent is moving into those roles right. that have the strengths, interests, and values to go into those roles and have had the exposure. So I'm thinking specifically of Shabri's work and Chris's work um, and providing the exposure and then ensuring that we have students who understand who they are and who they want to become so that it becomes a good investment. I mean, it's always a good investment, obviously, investing in students, but it isn't if we're sending them into a career path that isn't going to align to who they are and who they want to become. Right. That's a waste of money and a waste of their time. So. Maybe Shabri can share a little bit about the, the way that you're just making it possible for students to gain exposure to the world of work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so six years back, um, I was involved in a lot of these conversations across the country, uh, specifically in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I was part of these day-long conversations with uh, post-secondary um, K-12 employers, um, district leaders, everybody 
in a room like this at a table having day-long conversations about what we need to do to bridge this gap. And uh, what I noticed as at the end of the day is these conversations are great. It was happening across the country. But what was lacking was at the end of the day, everybody went home and there was no clear plan for how we were going to engage employers and everyone with students in order to bring that career exposure. So that's when you know it was kind of a spark for me saying you know technology has to play a better role in sort of leveling the playing field you know you have kids in rural school districts um, kids in areas where they don't really see role models within their communities and and students cannot aspire for something that they don't know exists you know so the answer to everything is the first step is exposure we need to show them what's possible and that's easily said than done you can be surrounded by employers around your school district in an urban area, but the average teacher in the classroom still does not know how to reach out to that employer and bring them into the classroom. So this is where you know the idea for NEPRIS came uh, six years back. Is said you know I I had this unique perspective of coming from the corporate side, working in education technology, understanding the school district needs to some extent, and and we said you know technology has to be in the middle of this, bringing all these amazing players together to really have a, a scalable solution. Right? We don't. It, we can reach 10 students, but our goal is to reach thousands or millions of students, and we can't do that without the support of technology, and that's what we do at NEPRIS. And, and in 14 months, 40 th 46,000 student views of live industry chats through the Cajon Valley School District. We couldn't put all those students on a school bus to go out and see places of work. Mm -hmm. it's, the true, it's true equity. Like, we can get into every nook and cranny of the district and have every child see a pro zoologist, attorney, whatever. Yeah, whatever. a graphic designer from right. Pakistan. Uh, we had the uh, Bureau of Engraving and Printing from Washington, D.C. Uh, doing a session on what's the chemistry behind printing money. And this was two um, Hispanic, um, there was a Hispanic woman scientist working for the federal government printing money. You kind of opened the world to all these students, you know, possibilities, right? So, Ed, could I do a follow on to that? One of the things that we were talking about, and I think is so important, is to be able to connect with students where they are. Mm -hmm. And I hope we can show that video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because um, our approach is to go to kids directly, to work with school systems, to work with partners. Mm -hmm. But what we found is going to students directly, we use YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Um, but so many of the things you said resonated. Having young people to be able to see someone like them who is experiencing the same kind of thing they are experiencing at the same time, or being able to follow someone who's in a career that they're not quite yeah. sure, mm -hmm. um, is, pretty, is pretty amazing. We started this process, we have a video experience on our website where there are a number of experiences students can actually partake in. We launched it at the end of September, we have had 10 million views. Wow. So that means that, and this is right, right within the age group of 12 to 18, mm -hmm. but they're, obviously this is resonating and young people are looking for the things that you were talking about. So if we can build on that as a, as a group, as a team, then I think we could really have the kind of impact we're all looking for. Thank you for the segue, Jean. I've been told that the video <laughs> 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 I'm 14 years old and I want to be a fashion designer when I get older. I want to either like design cars or do something with cars. I would want to be known for social justice. I want to be a pro gamer when I grow up. I want to be a celebrity makeup artist. YouTube, Netflix, cooking and dancing. do this is because I love to write. So, what do you think? I started this company when I was 13 by selling banana bread just on the street. He came to me one day and goes, 
Okay, I want to start a business. I was like, oh. I never told you why I really want to be a lawyer. If you want to be a lawyer, take classes in college that teach you how to think analytically. In America, I'm Indian. But when I'm in India, I'm American. I decided to take a giant leap of faith and fly to India. I was totally ready to audition for this part. It's okay to create your own path. Even though it might be hard, you'll get somewhere if you really love the things that you do. Hope will get you very far, I've learned that, because if you have hope, then that'll kind of give you a push to do what you need to do. Shabri, you talked about Nepris's role and helps us to have role models for our kids. Lisa, you talk a lot about role models and a lack of exposure. And how do we redesign the learning experience so that we can fill that void? If you think about how you grew up as a child, the context in which you grow up is everything. Um, from your family members to who you see at school, to what's happening around you. And so we know from research, um, Rod Chetty and others work, that um, the rate of innovation in America is down since the 1970s. Um, a huge reason behind that um, is uh, innovation happens in specific geographic locations around the country. Um, and it, this is tied to career opportunities, job opportunities, formation of your um, self-identity, and what you'll go on to be. And so. Um, Chetty refers to people who don't grow up in these areas or wealthy families as the lost Einsteins and believes that we could actually quadruple the rate of innovation, create more jobs, create more opportunity by reaching out to these lost Einsteins. Well, how do we do it? How do we create that context um, when you don't grow up in that space? And so the access to meet a pro mm -hmm. um, where if I don't even think I might be an engineer um, because I'm a woman and because I don't know people like that, um, but I might be able to meet someone like that on, mm -hmm. meet a, on uh, the Nepris technology, um, can have a huge influence on how people develop their thoughts um, about who they might become. So, um, and I love this research. Um, because it's looking so early. These kids are I, forming their identities so very early. Um, and we're finding out already in our year one data collection, I love this statistic, that 76% of middle school students already have at least one hoped for possible occupational self. Um, at least one that they can articulate. It's a very clear career. Um, not just I'd like to work in medicine, but I'd like to be a doctor or a nurse's assistant or whatever the career is. Um, really fascinating on the other side is we're also asking them, what is your greatest feared for possible self? Mm -hmm. And we're at a point where about 50% of the students can articulate something they don't want to become. And so um, we're just tracking that data. How do students' thoughts about who they're going to become, their identity, that formation of identity, um, helping them pull out their strengths, um, their interest, um, exploring careers that align to those strengths and interests, mm -hmm. um, that there's a range of careers, that I can meet many people that mm -hmm. look like me, um, that, and we know that it does make impact from the research. So, um, David, I forgot what your original question was, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm super excited about this work um, because, uh, and I'm really proud of Cajon Valley for taking the lead to work with mm -hmm. a research institute um, the survey that we conducted last year, our baseline data, we surveyed over 3,000 students, over 200 teachers, was the largest survey ever done of its kind of middle school students um, related to career and college readiness. And so understanding that early formation of career identity and how that leads into opportunities um, mm -hmm. post high school is just really critical. Mm -hmm. I, I have two kids that have graduated from high school and floundered. 
Um, I had a son who graduated from college and floundered. This is personal um, mm -hmm. for me. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and, and possible future selves. Chris, most people know the MBTI when they think Myers-Briggs, but tell us about the Innovation Labs and the work that you're doing to help uh, elevate this work. Okay, um, one of the things I wanted to comment on is the thread of going younger. Um, mm -hmm. If you think about the Myers-Briggs company, um, our traditional business in education has been with the Career Center at um, four-year institutions or community colleges. Um, so you think about it, a student that goes, they, they get into a major, and all of a sudden they realize after four, well, now six years, hey, I need to do, find a job, right? So what was the purpose before that? Um, so to give you some history about the Myers-Briggs company, we were hired, uh, we were founded in 1956 as Consultant Psychologist Press, um, very creative name, but uh, we were founded with uh, what's called the California Psychological Inventory, which even to this day is considered sort of a masterpiece in terms of personality assessment because of its predictive capacity and also its descriptive capacity around behavior and personality. So you can describe what somebody's going to do, benchmark that against performance, um, and then uh, help that person develop. Since then, we've acquired the Myers-Briggs assessment, the strong interest inventory, and a variety of other assessments used um, pretty universally in uh, the corporate world as well as education. What we did about four years ago is we realized, again, we saw this career center problem where we weren't really helping students um, when they needed to be helped, um, when, it was, when they were at an age where they could actually make decisions around what their pathways would be after they've already made decisions that may not be right for them. Um, so we wanted to provide universal access to our assessments um, through the innovation labs. And what we've done is we've built a platform that we call Vita Navis. Um, it happened to be a URL that was available, but it also means uh, ship of life. Um, and that's what we really see ourselves as helping students navigate the complexities of life um, through self-awareness and insight and the data that we uh, drive from assessments and other um, you know, site interaction that they do. So um, what we've done is we sort of flipped the model of traditional um, assessment from being a one-on-one -on -one experience with a, you know, an excellent practitioner like Ed Hidalgo talking to a single student. Well, that's not scalable. So what we've done is we've created modules around um, interests um, and then personality. And we start with interest because it's much more fundamental to personality. It's one of those things that gets um, sort of solidified early. Um, so it's th something we can influence early. But the whole idea is to make these self-administrable, self-interpretable, um, and then scalable, right? Um, and we also think that uh, we've seen a lot of organizations, whether they're districts or higher ed institutions, um, look at the aggregate data and better support their students, better find pathways for them. So we're really focused on universal access um, to assessments and then having organizations use that data to better support their end goals um, and their students and their employees in the long run. Patrick, you have a question? So, so in each of your roles, um, I, I know that you talked about some of the measurements. Um, what are ways that you guys measure impact and, and how you're making a difference in the lives of students and the lives of disconnected youth? So, so I, I can answer that uh, you know, fairly quickly. One of the things that we look at is student retention. Um, we recently uh, conducted a study in conjunction with the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, 19,000 students over two years with 38 minority serving institutions. Those were um, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, primar primarily black institutions. Um, so there are two cohorts, and both of those cohorts, 30% increases in retention. Uh, if they were involved in you know, taking the super strong assessment, um, which aligns the students' interests with the world of work and their studies, um, we saw a much higher level of engagement. We've also done different ROI surveys, so we do that through our platform as well. Um, and we can talk about specific use cases or examples. So we have a partnership with the school system in the central Massachusetts um, where we support a su explore class. And all seventh and eighth graders take the explore class and they have a variety of things that they are exploring in a nine week program. So we did pre and post testing. We have the first three quarters now of data that's coming forward. What was really interesting, in fact, I was in Philadelphia last weekend presenting with the superintendent of schools at the NSBA conference. And what we found was that pre and post test, you could see that there was an impact on students who could see that there were things that they really liked about these things that they were doing and wanted to take the next step and take the next course. But what I really loved about it was 26% of the kids who were in those classes said, never again. Don't want any part of it. Glad I had an opportunity to do it, but I absolutely don't want to do this anymore. So we feel as though building on that in other school systems, and ideally as we work more closely um, out in San Diego, we are going to get that kind of rich response. Yeah. Um, 
so for <coughs> us, this was a tough question to answer because when you're trying to build a technology solution mm -hmm. that's um, not really uh, curriculum, you know, like most school districts are used to um, content and curriculum implementations Ooh. where you can clearly say, okay, this is a math curriculum because of doing this for six months, now their math scores have increased, you know. Uh, unfortunately, when we're doing work like this, it's not like a direct impact measurement like that. So we have to really think about and get creative. So uh, we worked closely with the um, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation's impact team to say, how do we, how do we measure something when we can? It's not an absolute measurement, you know. So we we do uh, short surveys right after every live conversation with an industry professional. We measure three things. One um, is you know uh, relevance, exposure, and engagement. So it's a very simple question. It's a three question survey. Um, did you learn something about a career that you did not know existed before? Were you more interested in the lesson because of this industry engagement? And uh, what was the third one was, so relevance, um, yeah, that was uh, whether they understood the topic better and then whether they learned something about, about a new career. So very simple three question survey and we have now over 10,000 um, student, you know, data points. Now we can actually come to some sort of uh, understanding of whether this is working. So no, the ultimate question about impact is: Does this work? Mm -hmm. Do more kids graduate and know a career, know their strengths and self? Do they yeah. go into a career, or go into college? That would be the ultimate measure, mm -hmm. and that's longitudinal research and longitudinal work. And the district, um, we're in partnership longitudinally. Um, to study the changes from year to year to year so we actually can determine um, that beauty of the real impact long term. So I shared the 41,000. There's your measurement. That's got to go down. Exactly. We have to eliminate it. No, no you should um, be disconnected. Uh, there's a place in the world for everyone, as Ed famously says. We have to bring that down. So we have a benchmark already. And we're working hard at it locally through uh, our work, our partnerships with uh, the community groups and the school systems and, and more so we got to drive that number down dramatically and hopefully we can lead the way with the country because it's not San Diego alone five million that is a tragedy and if we don't bring that down we have to hold ourselves accountable fortunately we have good data to know exactly what this looks like around the region by zip code and, and so so forth so there's our benchmark the other thing that we're doing <laughs> Uh, among other initiatives is we started our own youth employment internship program. We call it Connect to Careers back in 2013. In year one, uh, we had 500 applicants. Last year, we had 15,000. So there's another measurement, but that's got to go much bigger. There's 41,000 disconnected opportunity youth. That number's got to double and triple. So we're holding ourselves accountable. Jobs cure a lot of issues. Internships uh, help uh, everyone on their way. We all went through that, and if you don't have that opportunity in your life path, you are delayed in so many ways that affects future income and future opportunities. So more, inter more internships, more jobs, and bring, drive down that number dramatically. Peter, I, okay, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask you a question. Can you talk to the converse side, which I've heard you talk about before, which is all the unfilled positions. I just think it's fascinating mm -hmm. how many unemployed there are in San Diego alone, uh, 16 to 24, yet how many unfilled jobs are there currently? That's a, a great question and a tough one, too, because we need more and more employers to step up and to be able to bring on internships at, at that entry level point so that they can find their way and, and go through their, their career path. But it's really hard on employers at the same time. I really empathize with them because they're having to put out their own funds in order to hire a person oftentimes with little or no skills. And it takes a lot of empathy on the part of the employment community to really step up and do that. We've been able to build more momentum through the city and the county being on board, not just leaving it to the private sector, and that just needs to grow. But to the issue of all of the, this, the skills gap is, is clear locally and, and nationally, but it doesn't just happen, as we know, magically. It's because of an awareness gap. 
and then an opportunity gap. And all these other gaps then lead to this chasm that we're experiencing now. So again, why we have to go early, why we have to change our work so that we're working with K through 12, which we really weren't doing before. And one other thing I just want to highlight is another simple but profound innovation was a discussion I had with Ed back at Thinkabit uh, a number of years ago because we put out our, our research on where the jobs are, the sectors, the career pathways, but we weren't sharing it broadly enough. It was going to professionals. You'd look at this cool report and you'd put it on the shelf and move on. But that's not the customer. It's, it's the educators and the parents and the kids. And so in that conversation we had, um, Ed came up with this idea, how do we get this in front of kids? And so that simple question then led to the creation of our priority sector poster boards, which then we put up and then everybody wanted them. We went from being able to put out our five boards and then we built an essential skills board and suddenly it just took off like a firestorm and we have over 5,000 of these boards in schools all <coughs> over the county that then the educators have turned into curriculum and, and then you have it in front of eyeballs every single day and then you can use that as a, a tool to open up eyes to these sectors they otherwise would never even know exist. So simple ideas and questions and driving for how do you do it better leads to innovations just uh, every single day. And I was just going to say one thing about what Shabri said which really resonated with me was that it's hard to isolate a technology and say hey this technology is having this direct effect on this metric. Right. Um, I see both of our companies as sort of scaling human connectedness and helping support cultural change within the organizations um, that we work with. We saw that especially um, with the minority serving institutions study was that the high performers there made huge changes within their systems, right? We helped scale that human connectedness and helped people talk to people um, through that medium, whether it's NEPRIS or an assessment um, that's easily available and accessible to both students and counselors. So, um, so it's interesting when you think about metrics, it's not, it's, it's, we're not a panacea. It's really that hard work that goes on in the schools that we support. Can I comment on the technology? Would that be okay? I was so impressed to find out that the, this entire experience, there's a tech stack um, that goes with it. So there's a human stack mm -hmm. and, and partners that are worked with, but there's a tech stack and uh, from Myers-Briggs, Vita Navis to um, Nepris to, I mean, it goes on and on, using Gallup for Strengths Finder to, right? And so think about that as uh, from a school district perspective, partnering with vendors, and I've been on both sides. I've been on a district side, I've been on a vendor side. Um, and the vendors working in relationship and being responsive to the district and the needs um, and modifying the technology. We just uploaded our survey questions or we're getting ready to um, into one of the platforms. And so there's great opportunity and synergy um, to work between districts and vendors to evolve the technology through research, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's a great win-win for everybody all the way around in the team. And I just wanted to compliment the team on no, the I, I do. That's a great point because, I mean, as a technology provider working with multiple districts across the country, I do have to say the ones like um, Cajon where we see biggest impact is where a lot of other things align, you know, leadership, direction, vision. Um, there's a common culture that's been created within the district where everybody is on board. This is not something you can teach. It's, it's something that, you know, um, the leadership and everybody else brings to the table. And I, we always joke about this, and I, if we can uh, clone, um, you know, what Cajon Valley is doing across the board, we will have lots of successful implementations, but unfortunately that's not, not that easy to do. So great job. I was, thank you for that work. And it, it really goes to classified and our certificated and our principals. And this work is happening with our teachers who are bravely doing it. None of it would happen without our trustees, um, everyone in alignment. But just back to that question on data, I was remembering to my old boss at Qualcomm who would always remind me that N equals one, that N equals one. Who's the one, who's the human that we're impacting today? Today, the person who's really at, right here is Berlin, and she's a fifth grader from W.D. Hall who's sitting here. And I couldn't be more proud of her being here today, and that her mom and her grandma brought her today, and the social networks that she's expanding. Schools don't have to own a monopoly on student social networks. 
I wish I could bring all of the students. <laughs> I wish we were doing an Empress chat here today. <laughs> um, but I'm just reminding back to N equals one. What's the impact that we're making on one human every single day? Every single day. Ed, this work started as a career counseling practice for adults. Can you lead the panel in discussion about employee engagement, uh, how that's lacking in what we learned in terms of student engagement? <laughs> Where to start? <laughs> I've learned a lot about that topic because I was really surprised when I was at Qualcomm that um, high skill, high wage engineers um, could be upset in their jobs. And that engineers who had gone to places like Berkeley, Stanford, MIT, um, didn't know how to manage their careers. And then you hear about a class at Stanford that's called Designing Your Life, and it's one of the most popular classes at Stanford. And then you start asking your questions, why are we waiting so long? And then I meet these amazing people who come together, work collaboratively, who also want to do something about that. And so for me, seeing that, and really for me, it strikes me at my core as a very bad student who didn't know there would be a place in the world, who always asked myself, who would ever hire me? I'm so bad at math. <laughs> Some of you heard those stories. I mean, really bad at math. My two children are dyslexic. I know where they get it from, although I've never been diagnosed. I could go on about that, and I won't. Um, <laughs> they deserve to be engaged at school. They deserve to be engaged at work. They have strengths, interests, and values that are needed in the world. So that's how I, I kind of select partners. <laughs> who really believes in this work and who wants to engage people within your own organizations you have, gone, you have gone so far with us to help engage our teams. But what does that topic mean to you, as Dr. Miyashiro shared? How do you see us continue to advance this work of engagement within your organization so that we can ensure that our teams are engaged, the districts that are here today that are thinking about stepping in and doing this work with us? How can we I think we just need this? to be as passionate as uh, Ed every day, <laughs> <laughs> truly, because in our world, it's so simple to stay within our, our space of distribute the federal funding, job done. Uh, that's not good enough, and we've uh, purposefully stretched every single day to diversify our funding so we can serve more people in more unique and innovative ways, and that will never end. We just have to be really passionate about it be really empathetic with where people are because there's a lot of people struggling. Unemployment is very low, but a lot of people are underemployed, still unemployed, and struggling to get back to where they want to be. And so getting in early um, is crucial, but there's a lot of adult uh, learners who still are on their pathway, and we have to support them in the most effective, innovative ways. And there's many more things ahead we're not even thinking about today that we've got to be willing to say, can we do that, and how do we go about it versus, no, that's not us, that's somebody else. I want to just, um, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but I, I want to just talk about uh, specific implementation examples that could be best practices that we've seen from this partnership and implementation, which even we hadn't originally thought about. Uh, one, the first thing that Cajon did with the platform was they said, we want to introduce kids to careers within the district. You know, um, what are people at, print, at the print shop doing? Um, school bus drivers. Um, there were so many careers within the district, which is kind of the low-hanging opportunity. Kids can immediately see, okay, I know, you know, I can kind of relate to this. And they did an amazing job of doing so many um, industry chats that were specifically focused on where the supplies were coming from for the schools, where you look at the school labels, where is it being printed, what kind of jobs do these people have. And it was all very relevant because it's in the, in the district. And the next step they did, which I think is, is a great best practice, is we bring the world of professionals through the platform, but what is most important is regional economic development, right? What are the jobs that are in your backyard? And there's no better person to really bring in local employers than the workforce board and the school district working together to do that. And now this actually makes a lot of sense for students. They can say, okay, this is a company that I drive by every day and I can go work here and that's actually now tied to my um, personality traits. And so you start connecting these dots. Now something that was so far out of reach seems very much within the possibility of, of doing. So these are some best practices. And one more example that they're in the middle of implementing, which I love, is 
your low hanging network is your parents. Um, I know not every district has the luxury of having a, a parent pool that, that comes uh, with different careers, but they do. Um, so now they're working on tapping into the parents as professionals and introducing students. And now you really have an engaged community. Um, I mean, there is, I haven't seen a better implementation with our platform. It go, it's gone beyond our imagination of how we would want to use this. So. So, two days ago, we, uh, we had parents watching an Empress chat, thanks to Melanie Brandt and the, the team. I mean, really, the team is doing incredible work. But we had parents. I don't know, were we translating in that experience? Because I know a lot, we were translating Spanish to English, and the parents were coming to our school to watch a live industry chat from the Myers-Briggs company in Sunnyvale, California. It's the first time we had tried with parents. Mm -hmm. But we know that the strategy must be a two-gen or a multi-gen strategy. It must include students, parents, and we're including grandparents. But now, I wasn't sure, actually. We were going to ask Shabri, is it OK to put parents on? I thought I was going to be getting in trouble. No. <laughs> and then she said, you is never, it students? You never get sure. in trouble with me. I know. People I was, are I all with me. And like, I go, I'll just ask for forgiveness <laughs> later. <laughs> but they really, they loved it. They, they were like, when can we do this again? Because you know, our parents don't, maybe don't leave their five mile radius, so they don't see what's possible for themselves. How can they see it for their students' future possible selves? Yeah, no, my kids didn't know what, um, they know what I do because I'm always on the phone driving them around, right? So, um, but they didn't know what their dad did until through a Nepris chat, my husband connected with the second grade classroom, with my younger one, and talked about what it means to be a semiconductor engineer. And it was like, we could have lived in the same house forever and ever, and my <laughs> son did not know. He just thought my husband went somewhere, came back home in the evening. You know? so, so. I just wanted to talk about the real heart of this work, which for me um, is really about your development as a human being. Um, and, and so we talk a lot about filling jobs and careers, which is critical. Um, but the theoretical framework underlying all of this is focused on the development of your self-efficacy, what you believe about <coughs> yourself. That it, So think back when you were little and what you wanted to be. You had heroes that you looked up to. And could I be that person when I grow up? And through understanding our strengths, our interests, getting exposure, having successful um, experiences, our self-efficacy, we start to feel like, yes, I can do that. I have a hoped for possible self. And it's that um, affect, it's that energy that I love about this work. So yes, I want my sons um, to get jobs <laughs> after high school and college. Absolutely. I want to help people that are unemployed. Most of all, I want to help human beings feel fully fulfilled. And like they, you can become whatever that thing was you thought you wanted to be when you were 4 or 40. Uh, and that's the heart of the work for me. And, and that, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I mean, one of the things that we've seen is, goes back to what Ed was talking about, N equals one. Um, I think oftentimes as managers or leaders, we try to impose systems and we want to you know, create um, you know, pathways for students. But what, what I've seen is that this really works from the bottom up. Um, students are empowered. They start to develop agency. They start to take action in, in the world. Um, and we've seen the same thing with the companies that we work with. When, when we have self-awareness, we understand who we are, our interests are, we start to make decisions that are informed, intentional, um, and we start to aspire to that future possible self. And I think that's what get the, gets the teachers going, um, is that they see that they can actually have this effect again on students, and it gives them agency. So it's really neat to see that, that journey, that parallel journey. And I think always emphasizing just the dignity of work in yeah. all jobs. All jobs are of value. You don't need to be a coder. You don't need to be that high-end step job. You service uh, sector is fantastic in hospitality, and these jobs are not going away. Uh, the dignity of who you are and your, your path and your life right. and where you want to be, and it goes back to that opening keynote around happiness. Yes. This is right. about happiness and what you've been inspiring David uh, in what you're you're doing and 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 uh, it's personal too with my two daughters I want them to be happy uh, fulfilled adults and whatever they do and to be proud of what they do thank you yesterday at lunch the Starbucks CEO talked about their partnership with Arizona State University on getting their partners through their uh, uh, college program and he talked about an anecdote where one of the the partners daughter's seven-year-old watched her mother working on herself 
to improve her condition and started to believe that that might be her choice when she grew up. And so I want to have you talk about two gen strategies. Chris, would you start with you know, why it's important to engage parents and students also? So what, what we've observed, and this started actually, Ed and I went to the Migrant Workers uh, Program up in, it wasn't in Sacramento, but it was in LA, right? It was in LA. Um, and we, Ed did a strong interest inventory um, interpretation with a group of honors students. But then we opened up uh, a larger group to all students, all parents, to come and talk about their, their interests um, through the super strong assessment. And we created a few questions that they, they could then discuss. And it was just amazing to see the level of engagement. Um, you know, one of the, one of the uh, phenomena we've seen is that parents oftentimes, especially in underserved populations that haven't had a lot of exposure to the world of work, they start to foreclose on possibilities for their children um, because they're not aware of what those are, right? Um, so what we're actually launching with Cajon Valley is a joint product development to um, develop what we call a career development playbook for parents and students. Um, so that uh, students on our Vita Navis platform and their parents can compare their interests, um, some personality measures, um, and then have a, a, a deep, meaningful, and even intimate conversation that builds the relationship between parent and child, but also provides that parent with the questions to ask. Oftentimes what we found is that parents don't know what to say. They, don't, they want the best for their children, but they don't know the actual mechanics of how to get there. Um, so that's what we're working on. We're really excited about it, and we think that two-gen strategy will not only help the students, it'll also help the parents open up their eyes to the possibilities of the world of work. So just three years ago, I thought two Jen was two Jen Jennifer's or something. I honestly, I saw nothing about this world, which again is why I'm appreciative of how education has transformed what we do, and so much so that we now have a two Jen strategy in what we do. We've started a new initiative called CLIM, the Center for Local Income Mobility. We've received some funding from the San Diego Foundation in order to go much deeper with 2Gen work, and it's a very purposeful, intentional work now with staff behind it. And we're also putting on a, a session in August with the, the foundation all around 2Gen in order to uplift that work. So much more to come on that. But uh, this has benefited me, that's benefited our organization, because if we do this right, we get in early and then we change the future. We're getting close to having our star Berlin on stage, but before we do that, Gene, would you start the dialogue on the bigger problem we're trying to solve? So we talked about the people, but the U.S. economy and our competitiveness globally is at risk with 6.5 million high-skill, high-demand jobs unfilled. And this is work that we're all passionate about. So Peter and Gene, would you mind closing our conversation on that topic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, listen, listening to the panel and particularly talking about skills gap uh, as it might relate in California, I would also tell you that in the state of Massachusetts, we have four sectors um, where we have a significant skills gap, uh, particularly in healthcare, IT, and manufacturing are the, are the top three. And I would also say that the construction industry in Massachusetts is also um, really struggling is the word I want to use. Um, and we are working with the uh, Secretary of Labor in Massachusetts and the Workforce Skills Cabinet there because just to talk about things, the local economy, how you can influence the local economy and be able to keep jobs in Massachusetts and be able to have um, the economy grow in Massachusetts if you fill the jobs that we can't currently fill. Um, the story that I always talk about is the fact that in Massachusetts right now, we have an incredible shortage of electricians and plumbers and contractors. And you would say, you know, how could that possibly be? Um, but a plumber in Massachusetts right now makes more than a primary care physician. Um, so that is how high demand these jobs are right now. Um, and to go back to some of the things that the panel, other panelists have talked about, kids can't know about careers, or they can't even aspire to careers if they don't know what they are, or they don't know how that they exist. And we have to do a better job in being able to expose kids at an early age to say these are all the possibilities in the hope that not only can we enrich their lives, but we can enrich the community that we live in and enrich the state. And obviously, just scaling this across the country, there are that many jobs where we have a significant skills gap. And if we do what we hope to do, all of us as a team, we can start to influence how we make that number come down appreciably, but also feed the economy and help young people feel as though they too are fulfilled. Could I just comment on there? We're finding through our year one research, um, this was the most interesting finding to me personally, um, we're seeing gender differences 
um, and how women or girls, uh, middle school age, view their hope for possible selves and their feared for possible selves when compared to males. And what we're finding is that girls can be more vivid in what they imagine, so they have more things that they hope for, and they also have more things that they fear um, can, can happen to them. We don't know why yet, um, but it's starting to come out in the data. And so I think about this a lot. Um, even technology companies, 6% of tech companies are founded by women. Yeah. Um, and we have issues related to gender in the career workspace. And so this ability to see myself in different roles um, could become really powerful yeah. uh, for women that are um, emerging into the workforce or may have grown up with a mother uh, raising children at home and not had that female role model in the home mm -hmm. um, working and and so where do you get that exposure yeah it's one thing is um, seeing people who look like them definitely goes a long way the other thing we've seen is um, you know if you look at the data you wonder why there are more women in um, life sciences um, careers, it's uh, as opposed to in programming, it's because when you write a line of code, um, you, you know, girls want to see how this is actually relevant in life. <laughs> so, presenting it in a different format, saying, okay, if you if you write a line of code, it helps create a prosthetic leg for someone and helps somebody walk. This connection for girls goes a long way in convincing them to pursue careers in technology. So that's one more aspect to add from that perspective. I was talking to Berlin earlier, and I have an 11 year old, and uh, I think the hottest topic is making slime. Are you into that at all? Berlin? Oh yeah, I do that. my kids are into that, yeah. Making slime, I think that's one of the industries of the future. My <laughs> Taking our detergent, I, I and oh my god, it's yeah. scary. Yeah. Uh, so all of our work is data driven and based upon research. And so that's helped shape what we do. We're putting out new priority sectors just in the next um, month or so that we'll be working with education on in order to share with our community. So it starts with data and being able to then put this out in, in, in really impactful ways instead of those slick reports that go onto shelves and then go into the recycle bin. So we have to figure out more and more ways to get this out to the community. I'm also inspired that the conversation that we're having here and throughout is helping other organizations like the Economic Development Corporation, who now has an inclusive economic uh, priority. And that really wasn't happening until recent times. And that helps guide those business leaders who aren't necessarily thinking about that every day, that this needs to be central to what they do. Much more to come on that, because we have a long way to go. And one last thing is we're also focusing really hard on this concept of job quality. How do we help employers raise the bar so that they're going to have the, the very best um, environment within and then the benefits offered, uh, that's crucially important going forward. So, so my, my final thought would be that the work that's happening is really in your hands, right? Um, the cultural change that's happening, um, the preconceived notions that we have. Who would have ever thought that a kindergartner could start to learn about the RIASEC framework and um, be able to express themselves and start to make decisions around their future, right? Who would have ever thought that? Even um, Natasha and I, our VP of Education Partnerships, we went to a school in Florida talking to a, a counselor that's well known across the country. And, the students coming in as freshmen, they just want to choose a major. Why do you have them look at careers first? Well, what's the purpose, right? We're looking to get to a future possible self. And um, so there's a lot of cultural change that needs to occur. And that's, um, I think that's the hardest work that's going on um, with you all in this room. So thank you for all of your support too. Final comments before we transition. Be before we think, okay, Ed, go ahead. I just want to thank Dr. Miyashiro oh. for being probably one of the greatest people I've ever met. <laughs> Super talented. I've, I've, I've got to hang close with you now for over a year and a half, and I've seen the journey for all those your superintendents, and certainly our trustees make it just a little teeny bit easier. <laughs> but it is, it's, a hard, it's a hard gig. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Before we thank the panel, there are candy bags on your tables, and the 20 most popular candies from childhood. We don't need everybody, but we need, we need at least 10 people to, to choose your favorites and bring them back to your table in a bag for the activity that's going to be very interactive in the second session. We're going to transition to stage so that we can have Berlin give her TED talk, which we just, um, we had our TEDx event on Saturday. And so two minutes, 
uh, transition time, get some candy, but let's thank our amazing panel for their <laughs> contribution.